Hi there, Dave and Tim here at the Single Malt Review as we venture back into Isla territory, am I right? Not quite. No. Okay. Um, not quite. It's um, though you'd be you'd be forgiven for thinking that that yeah. was the case. This is a bit of an oddity which just kept getting odder the more I did my research. Mm. I originally picked this up because I thought, gosh, this is one of the cheapest 10-year-old age-stated single malts I have ever seen. And um, that, it remains. Um, this is some of the most shockingly expensive 10-year-old mm. single malt I think I have really ever seen, taking, well, taking temporal effect without going back in time to sort of, you know, 1990s prices. Um, this was really, really cheap. Um, so the first thing I noticed on this, in my journey down the rabbit hole of how weird this whiskey truly is, is it is brought to us by your boys, William Grant and Sons, which you will know as the Grants people and the Glenfiddich people, and the Belvini and Canenvi people, I suppose, mm. if you want to go um, deep on it. But um, this is not a Grants bottle, it doesn't have their triangular sort of thing going on, and Damn it! If they're going to sell Balvini for the price I bought this for, that just that can't happen. If that happens, the universe breaks. If someone buys Balvini at a discount price, no, 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 no. So uh, what this is, and you actually really have to dig to get there, is a stealth launch of ten-year-old whiskey from a brand new distillery. Ah. This is called Airstone, which means absolutely nothing, that's just a brand name. What this is, is output from a very recent Grants owned and built distillery called Isla Bay, mm. which is where you got confused because Isla, it's not yes. on Isla. You can mm -hmm. probably all but see Isla from it because it goes down in Girvan, and it's in fact within the bounds of the Girvan Grain Distillery, which Grants also owns and mm. maintains. Um, which, just for just more layers of complexity, was built on the old site of the Ladyburn Lowlands Distillery. And I think there's probably still one or more bottles of Ladyburn floating around out there for astronomical collector's prices, if anyone was really interested. Um, and um, if anyone follows, the Hendrix Gin people also do oh. their business down there in the inbounds of the Gervin Busy folks. Grain Facility. So yeah, it's a pretty happening place down there. Mm. And, um, but nestled, nestled in there in what's actually a pretty old-fashioned throwback, having a single malt distillery within the grounds of a grain distillery, um, sort of a malt mill situation, although that was, that was a single malt nested within a single malt, um, mm. so maybe, maybe not quite, but anyway. Um, but what this is, is, yeah, with no fanfare whatsoever, just boop, out to mm. market, here is 10-year-old age-stated whiskey from a completely brand new distillery. Wow. Um, and so I was astonished uh, when I actually learned all of this because I thought this would have warranted a bit more fanfare, but no, mm. Grants was like, no, nah, yeah, sell it, bargain basement prices, whatever, boom, out we go. Um, people are paying $300 a bottle for Daft Mill, six-year-old, screw them, <laughs> throw them a bone, ten-year-old, <laughs> 20 bucks, away you go. Now, they call this land cask. Yeah, land cask. That's the, this, this is the gift that keeps on giving. This is why I had to write notes. Um, so I should do the pour or just be sitting here in front of empty glasses all day. The, um, the literature around this and much of the label is, to be honest, bollocks. Um, it, is, it serves nobody. The implication here that the earth cask is matured in land, and so it gains a robust and, in this case, heavily peated quality. <laughs> and the implication that that's how you make heavily peated whiskey is the worst kind of cobblers. What this is, is heavily peated output from <laughs> the Isla Bay distillery, and its sister release, also a 10-year-old, the sea cask. sea cask, is the unpeated version, <laughs> which I'm absolutely going to hunt down because I <laughs> want to try the unpeated version and really get a grip on the distillery mm. character because this one is as a heavily peated it's less easy to really get mm. a hold on what the character of this new distillery is but um, so aside from the like bafflingly dumb back of the <laughs> back of the thing trying to say that um, peat is generated in the cask based on where it matured <laughs> also completely baffling that they chose the inland matured one mm. to be the peated one and not the um, 
the C cask for the mm. Peter run. Oh, goodness knows. But anyway, anyway, that's not important. What's important is that we are, or at least you are, about to taste output from a brand new distillery yeah. for the first time and it's got a 10 year old age statement mm. on it. And they, aside from a few little pilot releases, they released precious little before this one. So they really held mm. on to their, um, they kept their powder dry on yeah. this one for many, many years. And I guess if one company could do it, it would be the Grants um, because they've, they do not have a problem selling whiskey. Mm. Um, they never have and probably never will. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, that's all the that's the bits and pieces. Mm. Um, and now we get to, to actually yeah. um, assess it as a whiskey, which is mm. the real the real business that we do here. I will say, though, I can understand using land cask as the, well, the naming for the peated version, since it's kind of created using the land, i.e. the dirt, the peat sod. Um, yeah, I guess. Mm, I guess. That, that yeah. makes sense in my head, at least. Though, yeah, it's the, the lack of fanfare is interesting. I guess, I suppose there's been so much temptation to just hype things to death on the media and on social media as well. I've seen it with other new distilleries in recent years, some of which just haven't delivered a stunning whiskey off the bat. So make you a bit low-key and just biding your time and just casually dropping a 10-year-old, sprinkling it onto the yeah. market. I can see the No, I, I really appreciate it. This is mm. a, I mean, it's a working distillery. It's yeah. not a prestige distillery. Um, and it is, it is here to work, and work it mm. does, because I think this is a pretty solid peated 10-year-old whiskey, but yeah. we will have to jointly be the judge of that. Yeah, 40% ABV, so... Yeah, ABV. 40%, I think we'll say, yeah. coloured, chill filtered, mm. yeah, you know, that was probably always on the cards, but never mind, never mm. mind, you can say exactly the same about Glenfiddich 12, um, their, um, their flagship offering, so... Never, mm. never shall we mind about that. I can also see the, the reason or the rationale behind labelling it as Airstone and not as Isla Bay, since that is going to make people assume Isla, yeah. and that will cause a world of yeah. confusion. That's so, a unique brand identity. Or, or it may just mean people, it's the, the one less Google step involved in finding out where it came from. I yeah. don't know. There may be some reason they're trying to keep the distillery here secret. Yeah. Hmm. Any, anything could be true. It's a real X file of a whiskey, but thankfully it's pretty mm. good, despite all that. So yeah, on the nose, first mm. thing we get is the peat, and it's a it's very a, Isla peat. Mm, it's a nice tarry peat. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. I would put this somewhere between the sort of tarry minerality of a Beaumont and the slightly smoky bacon citrus of a Colila, um, which, and I just described a great many, you know, that, that's a huge, that's the deepest yeah. end of the spectrum in Isla, that's the top of the bell curve, but what it isn't is the very, very gentle... Um, semi peated Bunnahabin and the really laceratingly peaty mm. Lefroig and Ardbeg. It's not like that, it's yeah. mild in comparison to that, but it isn't particularly mild to um, the uh, the rest of Isla. I looked up and it's um, they peat at around 22 ppm, mm. which is it is on the lighter end of the scale, I think. Um, sort of 30s and 40s is when things get pretty serious into your. Um, Lefroy's and your Ardbeg's mm. territory, but this has certainly isn't lacking for Pete anyway. Mm. So, on the palate, it's mm. fairly gentle both in terms of peat and in terms of the intensity of flavour. It's certainly peat first, but the intensity of it is fairly mild. It's yeah, it's it's quite gentle and restrained at first. I found it erupted into kind of a mouth prickling smokiness mm. right at the end. It came on sweet, then the peat eventually built and just kind of ignited into a fresh peat fire. Yeah, the the peat sort of you know it's it's medium peat. Um, the rest of the flavour is sort of fairly light and fairly spaceside. Hmm. Focused. There's a lot of white fruits. There's apple, pear. There's not a lot of really sweet stewed or stone mm. fruit or hugely aromatic kind of things in there. It's quite, quite light bodied and pretty quick, pretty rapid palate. And interestingly, this pretty well makes sense because, and it may only be a technicality. You know, if something is built within the grounds of a grain distillery. Does mm. it really have any? Um, does it really have any um, regional? sort of influence? Probably not. But to put it in its district, this is a lowland whiskey. This mm -hmm. is the first new lowland distillery we've gotten in a very, very long time. Um, it still remains an absolutely tiny distilling district, but 
Um, this is Lowland whiskey, and it's the only peated Lowland whiskey uh, around that I think you can regularly get your hands on. So it's interesting in so many ways, it's difficult to count. Mm. And yeah, that's an interesting balancing action on the peach too. It is intense enough to make mm. this a heavily peated whiskey, but not so much as overriding the rest of the character. It's not just a novelty peatiness. Yeah, mm. and it's. I don't think the peat is as integrated as it is in true. Isla whiskey, mm. I think, where we're having a 10 year old Collie Lowe or a Lafroig here, the gap between the peat and the fruit would be a little more mm. close together, it'd be a little more meshed. There's a certain there's a certain separation I get from this between the peat and the rest of the whiskey, which I get in some some distilleries which decide to do a peated version mm. of something which is usually not peated. You get this odd gap in the body of flavour between the spirit character and then the peat just sort of happens yeah. over here and I'm getting a little bit of that it is reminding me of a very young peated whiskey yeah. although I should say that like the last heavily peated whiskey I drank was the frankly horrific experience we had of the Matsui Ooh, the Matsui, uh, the, Matsui, the, Matsui the peated, peated. Yeah. yeah and uh, evidence suggests we ride. had a dodgy bottle of that because like, our experience was so at odds with the it's internet in general knows. so there was something, something bad happened either way though there's some lingering trauma from that and that that um, anything very heavily peated is setting mm. off alarm bells and that's happening here but I'm putting that aside and taking this as uh, um, as its own thing and but yeah the, the peat is slightly uh, separate from the underlying whiskey carrot it hasn't melded as you might expect after 10 years which is interesting it's yeah. not bad not good well it's that's a, just a unique factor that's another reason I really want to taste the the aforementioned mm. sea C cask. cask because yeah. That, I think, will more um, directly capture the distillery mm. uh, profile because we won't have this peat overlaid on top of it and we'll be able to see whether, you know, what, what's happening under the hood mm. without this sort of, without this veneer of peat painted over. Yeah. And I think, I think I might enjoy it a wee bit more because I don't think, I mean, this is a perfectly handy peated experience. I don't know if it really needs the peat. Mm. I mean... You know, yes, I bought this with it saying, you know, it's it's got Peter whiskey in it, um, or at least it can be inferred. So maybe a jokes on me, but um, mm -hmm. I think this might be even better if you just took that whole thing away and let it um, go on its own mm -hmm. as a ten-year-old straight, you know, straight as it comes, way you go. And that's exactly what I'm going to do once I can um, narrow down a bottle because they are pretty available and pretty cheap as well. But it's still in no way a bad experience. It's an 81 from me, mm -hmm. which. For a one of the cheapest single malts with a ten year on, and that's important because mm. you can get single malts with a with no year on, a little bit cheaper. This was staggeringly affordable. This was in the you know the the under ten percentile of the cheapest stuff you can oh. get out there. So they are pricing it to move. You can certainly say mm. that. I don't know. What what are your summary on this one? Well, this is a bold and quite ambitious new whiskey it's always good to see something which comes as a genuine surprise and it delivers a hefty dose of peat but with a good underlying whiskey character too this is 84 from me yeah it is promising and like you i'm tempted um very interested in fact to see what the sea cask has to offer and to see what comes out in future from yeah. the same distillery and considering you'd have to if you wanted peat like this you would normally have to go to isla mm. the difference in the price you'd be paying would be at least double, if yeah. not more, um, and that is by no means an exaggeration. Once you enter the, you know, the Isla, once you're paying the Isla tax, mm -hmm. just the price of admission to the island of Isla is pretty solidly high these days. Um, with that style of whiskey, in no way looking like it's going to become any less ravenously popular. So, as a um, as a stand-in for Isla whiskey, if you if you want that peak taste. Even though I don't think it's as integrated as more long-standing traditional bottlings, I think you can get that hit and you can get it for, yeah, half half the money you would pay. So, I mean, if you were rating this on value, you would rate this very, very, very highly mm -hmm. considering what it brings to the table. But, yeah, I think next step on this one is to try this sea cask and really, really get our tongues around yeah. what's going on with Especially this one. Especially if we can 
store some uh, sample size of the yeah well I'll, I'll lock this one away I'll put them in the northern in the whiskey vault um, yeah. and um, we can we can try them side by side and see exactly where that sort of peak begins and ends I think that'll be a good mm. exercise yeah so anyway we will see we'll check back um, in some number of weeks and I may have um, figured it out and got us a got us a bottle of the sea cask so until mm. then Slanger we will be right back